or eligibility of autism, basically they need to have a developmental disability that significantly affects verbal and nonverbal communication, social interaction, generally evident before the age of three, and this is the big difference, adversely affects educational performance. So it has to affect their education in some way. And how you define affecting the education gets difficult. Because at some ages, they may, like a preschooler, they're going to say education is peer peer interaction. But at, um, in middle school, high school, they don't really want you interacting with everyone else in the school. So, you know, that may, if that's your problem, it may not affect your education. So you have to really look at how are you defining these. Other characteristics that they define are engagement in repetitive routines and stereotype movements. You have to have both of those for an autism eligibility, but for a medical diagnosis, you need one or the other, or both. You know, you don't need both. You need to have resistance to environmental changes or changes in daily routine. Again, you don't need that for a medical diagnosis. A lot of kids have it, but you don't need it. And you have to have unusual response to sensory experiences where the medical diagnosis has taken a lot of the sensory stuff out and uh, the diagnostic criteria and made that more an associated feature to the disorder, <coughs> but not a defining characteristic. Also, autism does not apply if educational performance is, a, is adversely affected primarily because the individual has an emotional disturbance. And so you have to rule out emotional disturbance before you can move in an autism eligibility. And the reason they're doing that is before 1991, most kids with autism fell under emotional disturbance as their diagnosis, because they lumped it the same as a psychosis. So they're trying to rule that out before they put in the autism um, for that. This is the proposed criteria. You'll see how it's going to change. They do have public comments going on on this. So I think I have the website at the end. If you don't like the criteria, or you have an issue with the criteria, you can go to their website and actually comment on it. And the committee does look at those comments before. That's why it's not out yet. It was supposed to come out this year, but they pushed it back to 2013. So basically, they're saying, and now it's called autism spectrum disorder. There's only two areas that we're looking at. They have what's called social affect, where they've combined social and communication into one, which I think is actually really good because how social and communication are so tied together, splitting one out versus the other can get very difficult. So putting them together is actually pretty good. You need all three of these disorder of these criteria. You need to have deficits in social emotional reciprocity which is ranging from abnormal social approach and failure of back and forth interactions to reduced sharing of interest, emotions, and affect, and a total, total lack of social initiation. So these are kids that do not initiate for social interaction at all. Okay? You also have to have deficits in nonverbal communication used for social interaction. So that could be poorly integrated eye contact not integrating your verbal or nonverbal behavior. So we have kids, you'll see a lot where they may say, look over there. And you're, you're like, do I look where they're looking or do I look where they're pointing? <laughs> you know, so the, you know, if they do that, they fall under this criteria. And, or they may have deficits understanding other people's nonverbal behaviors and other people's facial expressions. And you see that a lot in autism where or teachers report, you know, like, this kid doesn't respond to the look. You know, within the first three days of school, everyone knows the teacher's look. Mm -hmm. These kids don't respond to that because they're not reading our facial cues. And there's actually research to show adults with Asperger's, when they're looking at a face, they're looking up here and down here, and they almost never look at the eyes. And so they're missing a lot of social um, information because that's where we give most of our social information. Um, they also have to have deficits developing and maintaining relationships, again, appropriate to developmental level, but beyond caregivers. So this has to be beyond parents. They can't, you know, most kids do have some sort of interactions with their parents. This has to be beyond that. So this would be teachers, this would be um, peers, and things like that going on. If they're not able to adjust their behavior to a 
to fit the social context that they're in, which kids learn how to do that by the age of four. Really, I just, I know how I can do this in church, but I can't do this at home, you know, something like that. Then they also have to have restricted patterns of behavior by having at least two of these. Stereotyped and repetitive speech, excessive adherence to routines, highly restricted interests, or hyper or hypo reactivity to sensory input. So they're putting sensory input back into the criteria for this. Now, some people are saying this criteria may be over, um, may be too hard to meet for a toddler, because most kids under the age of three may not be showing some of two of these problems, or they may not be a problem yet. So if you think about it, all young kids, if you see a two-year-old, they get excited, they jump and flap for a little while. You know, we would normally say autism. <laughs> you know, but typical kids do that too. It's to the extent of how much they do it, and how long, how much can you redirect them from that. Now, supposedly the text in the book of the DSM-5 is going to have examples for each age, so like toddlerhood versus preschool versus early childhood versus school age versus so they're going to explain this in the text, what they mean for each age of this, which is going to be very helpful, I think. They also say the symptoms must be present in early childhood, but may not become fully manifested until the social demands exceed their limitations, exceed their capabilities. So they're, they're trying to catch those people with Asperger's that a lot of times go through the system and don't get caught. They're sort of the funky kids that, you know, there's something odd about them. They don't have a lot of friends because there's not a lot of social demands on them. And so they want to see what happens when the demands, the social demands become too much for these kids. You know, they really want to look at that. And it impairs everyday functioning. So you can't just have this, it has to impair your functioning in some way. Um, this is the website. If you just go to DSM5, the number 5.org, um, you can put, I think on the right hand side it says autism. You can click on that and we'll bring you to this and then the public comment. Or um, when you get the slides, if you click on this, it'll bring you right to the autism criteria. Then you can look at it in more detail. And if you wanted to make a comment on it, you can. They're also now requiring you to make a severity level. So based on your social communication and your restricted interests, how much support do you need? You know, do you require support? Do you require substantial support? Or do you require very substantial report, support? So they're trying to get it so that you can use this diagnosis to see changes over time. You know, so you may have a child that is autism spectrum disorder at level three, but after early intervention, he's now level one you can say he's made progress. So they're trying to make this, you can track what's going on with them and you can know if what you're doing is requiring them to have less support in their everyday life. Um, so it's actually a pretty good thing to have this. Um, I go back and forth on it with young kids. You know, I don't think I'd want to tell a 15 month old that their child is a level three autism. You know, they're, because, I mean, I saw him for an hour or two hours. I don't know what his everyday functioning is or how much support he needs. Um, so it's going to be interesting to see how they really define that and when that has to go in. Um, and I said all of this comes out in 2013. So that's what I have. Anyone has any questions? I know there's a lot of numbers and a lot of just facts. Um, my son is excited to share with us. <laughs> she actually has a video to show you. Yeah. Um, you had mentioned the for ticket one third that um, <coughs> overnight is a sh dramatic shift in their language. Language or social behavior, yes. And I was wondering, has there been um, like brain studies where is there a shift with the brain in that short period of time, a dramatic? I mean, they've done brain studies. The problem with the, she's asking if there's been brain studies on those kids that sort of overnight lose the language or social tomato. Um, skills. There's been brain studies. The problem with them is most of them happen after the regression. Because you don't know who's going to do it, so you don't know who to do it with before versus after. And um, right now it's really hard to get young kids into some of those brain things. Like the best one is what's called a PET scan. 
But in order to give a PET scan, you have to put a radioactive isotope in their system that shows up on the scan. I don't know if I'd give my young mm -hmm. kid that. Mm -hmm. You know, so I don't think I could require a parent to do something I would not feel comfortable doing myself. You know, um, so they. But when they do the shift, they haven't found any differences in the brains with kids that didn't do the shift, do the regression, if that makes sense. So we don't know what they look like before, but. And, and oftentimes a regression is not like a snap, like overnight. It, it can happen over a, yeah. a period of a couple months where a child will have 20 words and three months later the parents realize they're not using any of those words anymore, but it, you know, it happened over a period of weeks or they can't pinpoint exactly where it happened. Um, or you may get kids that stop developing but don't lose the words they had. Right. You know, so those kids were plateau. Mm -hmm. And so people will say they regressed because they didn't, but they didn't really lose anything, they just didn't gain anything. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I forget what the new CDC reports have, but they look at that in their data, how many kids have reported regression um, in it. And there's, in their data is higher than the 30%. Um, I believe it's like 40%, but, so it's not that much higher, but it's higher than the general, um, the people that have done the studies before, where they've said about a third 